Well, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Um, I got into the acting business when I was about nine years old. And when I was 14, I got the role of Mike Seaver in Growing Pains. And at that time, no one knew it was going to be a big hit. Uh, I was late for the audition. I ran in there, uh, did my best, and uh, turned to the director and said, uh, so is this show a comedy or what? And he kind of thought to himself, uh, I think this guy just got himself the part because Mike was not supposed to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. I would have categorized myself as an atheist for most of my life. Didn't believe in God, couldn't see him, so I had no reason to believe in him. Uh, I certainly didn't have some sort of an emotional crutch that I felt was necessary to get me through life. I was living large. I was uh, on a great television program by the time I was 14, making more money than my father and more money than most people and could have anything that I wanted. So adopting a religious mindset would only put a wet blanket on all my fun. It really wasn't until I was about 17 or 18 years old that I started thinking about more important things. Uh, life, death, what else is out there beyond what I've already got? I've grabbed the golden ring, so to speak. Is this all there is? Is this really the end of the line if I got the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? What happens when I die? Because all this is gonna be gone, then what? Well, you know, the old theologians used to say that in the human heart there's a God-shaped vacuum that only God can satisfy. Uh, the book of Proverbs says that if you pursue riches, riches will never satisfy you. The heart of man is never, ever satisfied in those things. However, being satisfied with God, then you can enjoy all the things that God gives you because you see them as coming from His good hand. If you're just pursuing riches, pursuing riches, you know, the old Rockefeller story, you have so much, somebody said to him, how much do you want? He said, just a little bit more. If that's what you live for, then you're never gonna be satisfied. And ultimately, that's not gonna satisfy your heart. God alone, Christ alone satisfies the heart. And then everything you have, even the smallest thing, becomes a cause for joy and thanksgiving. But it was when I was about 17 years old, I was invited by a girl to go to church with her and her family and I heard a message for the first time that really made me sit up and think. It was a message about what happens to you when you die. And I realized that all of my fame, all of my money, all of my popularity would not impress the God who made me and gave me those things one bit. And that's when I began reading the Word of God and going to church. And internally, as I began to see the righteous standards of God reflected in the Ten Commandments. And I began looking at myself in the mirror of those commandments. I could see myself as a filthy, wretched sinner. When I lifted the lid of my own heart, so to speak, looked down inside and saw the filth and the grime and all of the, the secret sin tucked in the corners that I didn't let anybody else see, I realized that I was what the Bible said. I was a sinner who was blind by my own sin. I was in desperate need of God to forgive me, to cleanse me on the inside. I looked really clean on the outside, but on the inside, my heart needed to be changed from one that loves sin and loves myself to one who loves God and wants to serve Him on His terms. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. In other words, abandon all your own ambition, all your own will, all your own direction, your own choices, and totally and fully submit your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It is to say it's the end of me and I commit my life to Christ to follow him whatever the cost, even if it's a cross, and to obey him. Now, that was not what the rich young ruler was willing to do. He is a classic illustration of someone who will not deny himself. He wanted to hold on to his own will. He wanted to hold on to his own pride. He wanted to hold on to his own money. He wanted to hold on to his own ambition, his own sovereignty, if you will, in his own life. Uh, the, the, the competing issues are these, very simple. The gospel says, give your life to Christ and he rules. And if you're not willing to do that, it's because you want to keep the rule of your own life. The rich young man wanted his own 
life for himself. He wanted to control his own life. He had his choice sins, he had his choice religion, and he wanted to hang on to control. It's that simple. Coming to Christ means you give up the control of your life and you yield it to Christ. That's what kept him from salvation. He was unwilling to do that. Because my career, my livelihood, and my reputation was pretty much built on pleasing people, it was a struggle for me to come to grips with what it meant to please God because you do that over against pleasing people. It's, it's a mutually exclusive thing. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And if any man desires to save his life, he'll lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will save it. And we don't live in a country where people are getting burned at the stake for following Jesus, but you sure can get blacklisted. You sure can lose out on opportunities because of it. I've had uh, people tell me, well, Kirk, you sure picked the wrong religion in Hollywood, didn't you? You could come in and say that you worship a tree and throw your arms around bark all day long and people would say, hey man, do whatever you want to do. Uh, that's cool. But you come in and say that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm born again. All of a sudden, people want to step 10 feet back and, and point their fingers at you. People are happy for you to believe in God. They think it's great that you believe in God. People applaud the idea of believing in God as long as that God is not the God of the Bible. Because once you affirm the God of the Bible, then you get the God of the Bible. Then you get the law of the God of the Bible. You get the commandments of the God of the Bible. You get the morality of the God of the Bible. You get the holiness of the God of the Bible, the justice and righteousness of the God of the Bible, and you get the punishment of the God of the Bible. So, you have to face your own sinfulness, you have to face the reality that you have violated the law of God, that you're headed toward uh, uh, judgment in eternal hell, and in order to be saved from that, you have to turn from your sin and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. The bottom line is men love their sin. People love their sin. The Bible says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Now, there are all kinds of gods that aren't going to impinge on that, all kinds of religions, spiritual ideas, but not the God of the Bible. So to say that you believe in the God of Scripture is then to say that you believe in the law of the God of Scripture and the judgment of the God of Scripture as well as the salvation of the God of Scripture. It's that narrowness that offends the sinner because the sinner wants to hold on to his sin. The rejection of Christianity is not intellectual. It's not some intellectual problem, I just can't get there intellectually. There are endless reasons, logical reasons to believe in the, the God of the Scripture and the Scripture that God has written. It's moral. It's moral. They love the darkness because their deeds are evil. Not because they can't process it intellectually, but because their deeds are evil and they cherish those. You know, sometimes you'll hear people um, talking about how they found Jesus. Oh, so-and-so, uh, in the news today, so-and-so uh, uh, found God. They found religion in jail or some celebrity found Jesus. And I remember reading in John's book, The Gospel According to Jesus, where he said, no, 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 that, that, that's, not, that's not right. You didn't find Jesus. Jesus wasn't lost. You were, and he found you. And I was thinking, Yes, that's it. That's exactly what happened. I wasn't seeking after the Jesus of the Bible. His demands are far too high. I mean, what God wants from me is total and complete surrender and a dying to myself. I wasn't looking for that. We, we always say that people aren't truly saved until they are truly aware that they are lost. You see, that's why you just can't go in and say, hey, let me tell you about this wonderful message. Jesus loves you. God loves you just the way you are. He, he wants to bless you, bump you up a few notches on the scale of success, help you hit home runs, straighten out your slice in golf, make you feel good about yourself, give you your, quote unquote, your best world, your fulfillment, your purpose. That's not the gospel. The gospel is he wants to deliver you from your sins which are going to condemn you to eternal hell. And until a person understands the reality of their lostness and fully comes to grips with that, 
that they have sinned against God, violated God's law, that they cannot remedy that, that they are headed for hell, that they will never have any purpose in this life, any meaning in this life, and certainly in the life to come, apart from salvation through Jesus Christ, they don't reach a level of desperation, uh, which drives them to a true salvation. I was lost and God found me and he drew me in to the truth of scripture and caused me to embrace it with all of my heart and that's the beauty of the power of God to take a guy who's not seeking God at all and to seek him out to find him and make him a new creature in Christ.